We have Alex Spira, Boston Globe Red Sox writer on. He's joining us on the Harbor One Hotline. Alex, how are you doing? And can you give us any indication as to high, how high the uh, Red Sox were willing to go with Xander Bogarts? Because we, we've all seen the $160 million over six years figure um, and some reporting that that wasn't the highest that they would go. Can you give any clarity to that? Yeah, that was me reporting it. So happy to do so. And uh, thanks for asking. I feel like crap because I got 90 minutes of sleep on, uh, on the red eye back. But, uh, you know, it was a weird end to the winter meetings. Um, so, yeah, the the last formal I, I my understanding is that the last formal offer that the Red Sox uh, submitted was a six year uh, was a was a six year proposal in the neighborhood of 160, 162 million dollars, about 27 million dollars a year from an AAV standpoint. Uh, they did express openness, from what I'm, uh, from what I understand, to moving past that. Right, that was a negotiating point. Um, that was going to be a negotiating point on uh, on Wednesday, and probably you know their openness to you know kind of being a bit open minded about that figure maybe gave uh, gave the impression. I, that's that's what I suspect uh, led to some of those reports about there being momentum in the talks, but. Uh, that was never, it wasn't like they were going to go blowing past that. Like my, uh, I, I never heard any indication that the Red Sox were going to go to $200 million. In fact, uh, during the winter meetings, I had heard early in the winter meetings, uh, I encountered surprise from, uh, some Red Sox officials, um, at the suggestion that, uh, that the, uh, that the bidding might get up to $200 million and kind of skepticism about uh, about whether or not the Red Sox would close the deal if it did get to that point. So um, I, I think that it was very clear that the Red, that while there might be some room to give with uh, with the Red Sox proposal uh, at that six and roughly 160-ish, um, that it was never, ever, ever going to get anywhere close to uh, to the very rare air where the Padres landed. So, Alex, do you think if they would have, uh, you know, locked him up uh, before the season do you think that the number would be more manageable and it wouldn't have obviously went to the, what is it 280 that it ended up doing oh yeah I, th- I think that um look bogart's bogart's instructed boris back in 2019 do the deal this is where i want to be this is where i love uh, i'm really happy in this organization and the red sox have always meant a lot to xander bogart's um, he was he, he I, I think that he would have even even though he had a more confident place uh, a, a more confident understanding of his place in the marketplace um, and of his place in the game. Uh, I think that he still uh, he still valued the idea of he would have loved to have entered this year um, without uncertainty. And he, um, you know, he viewed I, I think that he viewed himself as being a guy who you know who should be treated like Jose Altuve was back in 2017. I think 2017, 2018, when he signed a five-year, 151 million dollar deal with the Astros a couple of years out from free agency. Um, I think that, you know, Bogarts was really excited about the acquisition of Trevor Story, but I think that, you know, when, when the Red Sox made the uh, commitment to Story, I think that, um, I think that Xander would have probably welcomed it if the Red Sox had used, had used that as kind of a, a marker in the, uh, in the negotiations and say, Hey, let's build off of that. Um, that, that framework that, uh, that we use to reward a really good shortstop. Uh, let's, Let's talk about that. And that's not what they did. They uh, they gave him a proposal that was nowhere in that vicinity. They were willing to tack on the one year and thirty million dollars, bringing the total commitment to four years, and ninety million dollars, which is like insane, right? Like that's two hundred million dollars less than what he ended up with. Mm-hmm. Um, so it wasn't a, that wasn't the first volley of negotiations. Uh, that ended up being a last volley in spring in in pre season negotiations and in, in spring training negotiations that ultimately kind of led to the, you know, to the window where you would have Bogarts kind of wandering through the year thinking, okay, there's a, there's a real possibility that I won't be back as much as he kept reiterating over and over. Like, I'd love to be back. Um, it, it, it kind of made clear that that was a real possibility. Alex, we uh, heard reports, and I'm sorry if this was your report. There's been so many reports, sorry, so my Alex. bad if this was yours, but uh, that the uh, that ownership got involved in these negotiations recently over the, uh, I think yesterday there was a report that they were on a call that night or maybe the next morning. Um, can you speak to what their involvement was? I can't. Uh, that one I don't have a great feel for. I, I don't. I don't. Have, I mean, the owners have been. Um, I'm. I'm sure owners would be uh, in with a negotiation like this. Uh, involved regularly, probably having 
uh, getting up to, whether getting updates from Chaim Bloom and Sam Kennedy, both of whom were at the winter meetings, uh, or sometimes perhaps with direct contact um, with Scott Boris, who uh, is very happy to to kind of take out the bat phone to owners uh, left and right. He uh, he is very comfortable um, reaching out directly to uh, to owners whenever possible. So um, I, I would I would I, I think it's fair to assume that the that the Red Sox owners were uh, perfectly well aware of uh, of where offers stood and where the bidding was going and where where the Red Sox were going with their proposals. So what do you make of them sort of jumping in at the last minute like that? Again, I, I can't speak to what okay. I, I uh, yeah, that's that's not me. I, I don't know that they did. I, I would suggest that they that it's almost certain that they were involved throughout, but I don't know whether or not they were kind of um, trying to act as a catalyst in negotiations. Alex, uh, now that this news has dropped, in your opinion, do you feel like the uh, Red Sox right now have a firm grasp of what the market is for players like Xander when you're looking down the road at players like Devers? And um, are they prepared to offer one of these big contracts for Devers? It's a fair question. Uh, And obviously, obviously the answer to this point is no, because they don't have an agreement with him. Um, and I think that there's been, uh, you know, I, Devers is a bit tricky because there aren't a lot of comparable uh, third basemen really who are in his ca- who have contracts like the one that is being negotiated. You might have an, a Nolan Arenado type who's agreed to an extension, um, and he is making. He's not. He didn't hit the three hundred million dollar threshold that uh, that it seems like Devers is really targeting. Um, and Nolan Arenado is a better all around player who is in the kind of uh, compar- comparable age bracket, but you know it's okay for Devers to want more than what Nolan Arenado agreed to uh, with the uh, with the Colorado Rockies, particularly because um, you know Nolan Arenado signed that deal and then found that he was quickly miserable and <laughs> wondering why he had agreed to a uh, to a below market deal uh, with a team whose uh, commitment to winning he uh, he questioned. So you know the market has changed since no- since Nolan Arenado, Arenado signed his deal. Um, I. I think that we're, we, we have uh, – the, the jury is out on whether or not the Red Sox um, are willing to make the kind of, you know, 10-year you – know, t- whether or not they're willing to make a, a commitment of more than, uh, more than $217 million, which is the high watermark for any contract they've ever agreed to. So, so we're talking to Alex Spear. Um, Alex, now, is this, you know, you know, referencing Devers, what's this – isn't he, like, the big winner in this, you know? Like, based on the, – there oh, is yeah. the overall comp and – you know, it's almost like, you know, you, you thought they learned their lesson with John Lester. They did it. And now here comes another example of like a really like a, a landmark type of player. Now he's gone. So I'm assuming that, you know, this wouldn't happen with Devers. I think they would like, hey, let's make sure I overpay so I don't lose and, and I'll set the comp. Well, I mean, there's the history of like John Lester departing when the Red Sox didn't uh, didn't play at the top of the market. And then shortly after that. Uh, Dave Dombrowski comes on board and gives David Price a record-setting contract of $217 million when they had been at $70 million to start the negotiations with Lester. So um, it's not necessarily apples to apples, but we're we're talking about the fruit family. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Alex, with uh, with all this being said, what what's the next step? I mean, where do you where do you obviously you got to start taking steps to try and replace uh, what Xander Bogart's brought? There's still some guys out there on the market. Any indication which direction the team will be going now? No, uh, I, I think that I, I think that there. My guess is that there's kind of going to be a um, you know there's going to be some retrenching. Like I'm sure that uh, everyone in the Red Sox front office is pretty strung out and exhausted as well because uh, they were all split across the two red eye planes that were going back. Uh, from San Diego last night. So uh, there might be a little bit of a recalibration post winter meetings in which they, uh, in which they make some decisions about, okay, do we involve ourselves in the dance B Swanson market? Uh, do we involve ourselves in the Carlos Correa market? Um, now that, you know, if, if you're going to be offering a giant bag of money uh, to a shortstop that maybe, you know, then maybe it makes sense to go beyond the comfort zone, uh, if Xander Bogarts was a two hundred eighty million million dollar player, then maybe maybe Carlos Correa suddenly becomes more intriguing to them um, at something I don't know manageably north of that. But I, I don't know how much further north uh, the bidding will go for Correa than that. Um, so there are a lot of different directions. I also reported from the winter meetings that the Red Sox uh, had been 
heavily involved in a trade uh, conversation with the Brewers about Colton Wong um, as a uh, as a kind of insurance option, acquiring a second baseman that would allow uh, that would allow Trevor Story to move over to short, um, potentially if Bogarts went, or they could have surplus in the middle infield if they were to re-sign Bogarts. So maybe they re- maybe they revisit the uh, the the trade market for uh, for a second baseman slash shortstops um, because it, it very much appears that they were uncomfortable with the top of the shortstop market in terms of financial commitments. All right, Alex Spear from the Boston Globe. Thanks so much for joining us, Alex. Alex. And please Get some rest. Go take a nap. You've earned it. Right. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. We should all have nap time.